The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Book 5, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Chapter 11, The Dufflepuds Made Happy. Lucy followed the great lion out into the passage, and at once she saw coming towards them an old man, barefoot, dressed in a red robe, his white hair was crowned with a chaplet or chaplet of oak leaves. His beard fell to his girdle, and he supported himself with a curiously carved staff. When he saw Aslan, he bowed low and said, Welcome, sir! To the least of our, to the least of your houses. Do you grow weary, Coriakin, of ruling such foolish subjects as I have given you here? No, said the magician. They are very stupid, but there is no real harm in them. I begin to grow rather fond of the creatures. Sometimes, perhaps, I am a little impatient, waiting for the day when they can be governed by wisdom instead of this rough magic. All in good time, Coriakin, said Aslan. Yes, all in very good time, sir, was the answer. Do you intend to show yourself to them? Nay, said the lion with a half growl that meant Lucy thought the same as a laugh. I should frighten them out of their senses. Many stars will grow old and come to take their rest in Ireland before your people are ripe for that. And today, before sunset, I must visit Trumpkin the Dwarf, where he sits in the castle of Care Paravel counting the days till his master Caspian comes home. I will tell him all your story, Lucy. Do not look so sad. We shall meet again. Please, Aslan, said Lucy. What do you call soon? I call all time soon, said Aslan and instantly he was banished away, and Lucy was alone with the magician. Gone, said he, and you and I quite crestfallen. It's always like that. You can't keep him. It's not as if he were a tame lion. And how did you enjoy my book? Part of it was very much, in part of it very much indeed, said Lucy. Did you know I was there all the time? Well, of course I knew when I let the duffers make themselves invisible. That you will be coming along presently to take the spell off. I wasn't quite sure of the exact day, and I wasn't especially on the watch this morning. You see, they have made me... Me invisible too, and being invisible always makes me so sleepy. Hi-ho! There, I'm yawning again. Are you hungry? Well, perhaps I am a little, said Lucy. I've no idea what the time is. Come, said the magician. All times may be soon to Aslan, but in my home all hungry times are one o'clock. All hungry times are one o'clock. <laughs> he led her a little way down the passage and opened the door. Passing in, Lucy found herself in a pleasant room full of sunlight and flowers. The table was there and they entered when they entered, but it was of course a magic table, and at a word from the old man, the tablecloth, silver plates, 
and food appeared. I hope this is what you would like, he said. I have tried to give you food more like the food of your own land than perhaps you have had lately. It's lovely, said Lucy. And so it was. An omelette, piping hot, cold lamb and green peas. A strawberry ice. Lemon squash to drink with the meal and a cup of chocolate to follow. But the magician himself drank only wine and owned and ate only bread. There was nothing alarming about him, and Lucy and he were soon chatting away like old friends. When will the spell work? asked Lucy. Will the duffers be visible again at once? Oh yes, they're visible now, but they're probably all asleep still. They always take a rest in the middle of the day. And now that they're visible, are you going to let them off being ugly? Will you make them as they were before? Well, that's rather a delicate question, said the magician. You see, it's only they who think they were so nice to look at before. They say they've been uglified. But that isn't what I call it, called it. Many people might say the change was for the better. Are they awfully conceited? They are. Or at least the chief duffer is, and he's taught all the rest to be. They all believe every word he says. We've noticed that, said Lucy. Yes, we'd better get better without them. No, we'd better get on, we get on better without them in a way. Of course, I could turn them into something else or even put a spell on them which would make them not believe a word he said. But I don't like to do that. It's better for them to admire him than to admire nobody. Don't they admire you? asked Lucy. Oh, not me, said the magician. They wouldn't admire me. What was it you uglified them for? I mean, what they call uglified. Well, they wouldn't do what they were told. Their work is to mine the garden and raise food not for me, as they imagine, but for themselves. They wouldn't do it at all. And if I didn't make them, and of course, for a garden you want to, you want water. There is a beautiful spring about half a mile away up the hill. And from that spring there flows a stream which comes out right past the garden. All I asked them to do was to take their water from the stream instead of trudging up to the spring with their buckets two and three two or three times a day and tiring themselves out, besides filling half of it on the way back. But they wouldn't see it. In the end, they refused point blank. Are they as stupid as all that? asked Lucy. The magician sighed. Oh, you wouldn't believe the troubles I've had with them. A few months ago, they were all for washing off the plates and knives before dinner. They said it saved them afterwards. They, they, they said it saved time afterwards. I caught them planting boiled potatoes to save cooking them. When they were dug up, one day the cat got into the dairy and twenty of them were at work moving all the milk out. No one thought of moving the cat. But I see you've finished. Let's go and look at the duffers now. They can be looked at. They went into the other room, which was full of polished instruments, hard to understand, such as astrolabels, or, or, or orreries, chronoscopes, 
picoether meters. Coriambuses, or Coriambuses, and Theodolins. Oh, <laughs> and here, when they had come to the window, the magician said, There, there are your duffers. I don't see anybody, said Lucy. What are those mushroom things? The things she pointed at were dotted all over the level grass. They were certainly very like mushrooms, but far too big. The stalks about three feet high, and the umbrellas about the same length from edge to edge. When she looked carefully, she noticed too that the stalks joined the umbrellas, not in the middle, but at one side which gave an unbalanced look to them. And there was something, a sort of little bundle lying on the grass at the foot of each stalk. In fact, the longer she gazed at them, the less like mushrooms they appeared. The umbrella part was not really round, as she had thought at first. It was longer then it was broad and it widened at one end there were a great many of them 50 or more the clock struck three instantly a most extraordinary thing happened each of the mushrooms suddenly turned upside down the little bundles which had lain at the bottom of the stalk were heads and bodies the stalks themselves were legs, but not two legs to each body. Each body had a single thick leg right under it, not to one side like the leg of a one-legged man, and at the end of it a single enormous foot, a broad-toed foot with the toes curling up a little so that it looked rather like a small canoe. She saw in a moment that they had looked like mushrooms. Now, why they looked like mushrooms? They had been lying flat on their back, each with its single leg straight up in the air and its enormous foot spread out above it. She learned afterwards that this was their ordinary way of resting, for the foot kept off both rain and sun and for a monopod to lie under its own foot is almost as good as being in a tent oh the funnies the funnies cried lucy bursting into laughter did you make them like that yes yes i made the duffers into monopods said the magician he too was laughing till the tears ran down his cheeks. But watch, he added. It was worth watching. Of course, the little one-footed men couldn't walk or run as we do. They got about by jumping, like fleas or frogs. And what jumps they made! As if, uh, as if each big foot were a mass of springs and with what a bounce they came down. That was what made the thumping noise which had so puzzled Lucy yesterday. For now they were jumping in all directions and calling out to one another, Hey lads, we're visible again! And there they are guys, their little picture there, that's them. Yep, there you go. Visible we are, said one in a tattled red cap, who was obviously the chief monopod. And what I say is, when chaps are visible, why they can see one another. Well, duh. <laughs>
<laughs> ah, there it is, there it is, Chief, cried all the others. There's the point. There's no one's got a clearer head than you. You couldn't have made it plainer. She caught the old man napping, that little girl did, said the chief monopod. We've beaten him this time. <laughs> Just what are we going to say ourselves, chimed the chorus. You're going stronger than ever today, chief. Keep it up, keep it up. But if they dare talk about you like that, said Lucy. They seem to be so afraid of you yesterday. Don't they know you might be listening? That's one of the funny things about the duffers, said the magician. One minute they talk as if I ran everything and overheard everything and was extremely dangerous. The next moment they think they can take me in, take me in by trick that a baby would see through. Bless them. Will they have to be turned back to their proper shape? Asked Lucy. Oh, I do hope it wouldn't be unkind to leave them as they are. Do they really mind very much? They seem pretty happy, I say. Look at that jump. What were they like before? Common little dwarf, said he. Nothing like so nice as the thought you have in Narnia. It would be a pity to change them back, said Lucy. They're so funny, and they're rather nice. Do you think it would make any difference if I told them that? I'm sure it would. If you could get into their heads. Will you come with me and try? No, no. You'll get on far better without me. Thanks awfully for the lunch, said Lucy, and turned quickly away. She ran down the stairs, which she had come up so nervously that morning, and cannoned into Edmund at the bottom. All the others were there with him waiting, and Lucy's conscience smote her when she saw their anxious faces and realised how long she had forgotten them. It's all right, she shouted. Everything's all right. The magician's a brick. And I've seen him. Aslan. After that, she went from them like the wind and out into the garden. Here the earth was shaking with the jumps and the air ringing with the shouts of the monopods. Both were redoubled when they caught sight of her. <laughs> Here she comes! Here she comes! they cried. Three cheers for the little girl! Ah! She put it across the old gentleman properly, she did. And we're extremely regrettable, said the chief monopod, that we can give you the pleasure of seeing us as we were before we were uglified, for you wouldn't believe the difference, and that's the truth, for there's no denying we're mortal ugly now. So we won't deceive you. Uh, that we are, Chief, that we are, echoed the others. Bouncing like so many toy balloons. You said it, you said it. But I don't think you are at all, said Lucy, shouting to make herself out. I think you look very nice. Hear her, hear her, said the monopod. True for you, Missy. Very nice we look. We couldn't find a handsomer lot. 
They said this without any surprise and did not seem to notice that they had changed their minds. She's a saying, remarked the chief monopod. That's how we looked very nice before we were uglified. True for you, chief, true for you, chanted the others. That's what she says. We heard her up else. No, that's not what she said. She said you look nice in your current form. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't a bunch of little mushroom people look nice? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did not, bawled Lucy. I said you're very nice now. So she did, so she did, said the chief monopod. Said we were very nice then. Here and both, here and both, said the monopods. That's a pair of you, always right. They couldn't have put it better. But we're saying just the opposite, said Lucy, stamping her foot with impatience. So you are, to be sure, so you are, said the monopods. Nothing like an opposite. Keep it up, both of you. You're enough to drive anyone mad, said Lucy, and gave it up. But the monopod seemed perfectly contented, and she decided that on the whole, the conversation had been a success. I think that was quite the opposite of a success. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And before anyone, and before everyone went to bed that evening, something else happened, which made them even more satisfied with their one-legged condition. Caspian and all the Narnians went back as soon as possible to the shore to get their news to Rince and the others on board the Dawn Treader, who were by now very anxious, and, of course, the monopods went with them, bouncing like footballs, and agreeing with one another in loud voices, till Eustace said, I wish the magician would make them inaudible. The first sensible thing is actually said all story. Okay. <laughs> Instead of invisible, he was soon sorry he had spoken because then he had to explain that an inaudible thing is something you can't hear and though he took a lot of trouble he never felt sure that the monopods had really understood and what especially annoyed him was that they said in the end eh, he can't put things up the way our chief does but you'll learn young man talk to him he'll show you to say he'll show you how to say things there's a speaker for you. When they reached the bay, Reaper Chief had a brilliant idea. He had his little corkle lowered, a coracle, he had his little coracle lowered and paddled himself about in it until the monopods, until the monopods were thoroughly interested. He then stood up in it and said, Worthy and intelligent monopods, you don't need boats. Each of you has a foot that will do instead. Jump as lightly as you can on the water and see what happens. The chief monopod hung back and warned the others that they'd find the water powerful wet. But one or two of the younger ones tried it almost at once. And then a few others follow their example, and at last the whole lot did the same. It worked perfectly. The huge single foot of a monopod acted as a natural raft or boat, and when Reaper Cheap had taught them how to cut rude paddles for themselves, rude paddles! <laughs> <laughs>
They all paddled about the bay and round the dawn treader, looking for all the world like a fleet of little canoes, with a fat dwarf standing up in the extreme stern of each and they had races and bottles of wine were lowered down to them from the ship as prizes and the sailors stood leaning over the ship's sides and laughed till their own sides ached the duffers were also very pleased with their new name of monopods which seemed to them a magnificent name though they never got it right. That's what we are, they bellowed. Money pods. Pomon. <laughs> Pomonots. Podimons. Just what was it on the tips of our tongues we called to call ourselves? But they soon got it mixed up with their old name of Duffers and finally settled down to calling themselves the Duffel Pubs. And that is what they will probably be called for centuries. That evening all the Narnians denied that dined upstairs with the magician and Lucy noticed how different the whole top floor looked now that she was no longer afraid of it the mysterious signs on the doors were still mysterious but now looked as if they had kind and cheerful meanings and even the bearded mirror now seemed funny rather than frightening at dinner everyone had by magic what everyone liked best to eat and drink and after dinner the magician did a very useful and beautiful piece of magic he laid two blank sheets of parchment on the table and asked Grinian to give him an exact account of their voyage up to date and as Grinian spoke everything he scribed came out onto the part came out on the parchment in fine clear lines till at last each sheet was a splendid map of the eastern ocean showing Gorma, Terebinthia, the Seven Isles, the Lone Islands, Dragon Island, Burnt Island, Death Water and the land of the Duffers itself all exactly the right sizes and in the right positions they were the first maps ever made of those seas and better than any that have been made since without magic for on these though the towns and mountains looked at first just as they would on an, on an ordinary map when the magician lent them a magnifying glass he saw that they were perfect little pictures of the real things so that you could see the very castle and slave market and streets in Narrowhaven all very clear though very distant like things seen through the wrong end of a telescope the only drawback was that the coastline of most of the islands was incomplete for the map showed only what Grinian had seen with his own eyes. When they were finished, the magician kept one himself and presented the other to Caspian. It still hangs in his chamber of instruments at Care Parabelle. But the magician could tell them nothing about the seas or lands further east. He did, however, tell them that about seven years before a Narnian ship had put in at his waters and that she had on board the Lord Revillian Argos Mabramorn and Roop so they judged that the golden man they had seen lying in death water 
must be Lord Rethemar. Next day, the magician magically mended the stern of the Dawn Treader, where it had been damaged by the sea serpent, and loaded her with useful gifts. There was a most friendly parting, and when she sailed two hours after noon, all the duffel pugs paddled out with her to the harbour mouth and cheered until she was out of sound of their cheering. And that was chapter 11 of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Hope you enjoyed it. But next time we dive into chapter 12. The Dark Island. Until then, thanks for watching.